Okay. Our first item is to approve the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, are there any objections to the agenda as it stands? Seeing none, the agenda is passed. Uh, everybody has had a chance to see the proceedings from the August 2017 meeting. Are there any uh, edits or changes to the proceedings? Seeing none, are there any objections to approving the proceedings as uh, submitted? Seeing none, that is item number two. Uh, for item number three, public comment, we have three people who have signed up for public comment. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Mitch Feigenbaum. MFC and the EEL Board on the occasion of the Commission's 76th Annual Meeting, thank you Chairman Clark for the opportunity to offer some comments today. My name is Mitchell Feigenbaum. I'm a member of the EEL Advisory Panel and the principal of Delaware Valley Fish Company, an EEL exporter near Philadelphia. I am involved with other ventures including Nova EEL, a research and development company in Canada. Nova Eel is based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Almost all of its shareholders are glass eel quota holders in Maine and Canada. I am here to report on its efforts. We are a professionally managed company focused on one goal, to transform North America's $25 million glass eel fishery into a world-class aquaculture and fish processing industry worth $250 million. Presently, glass eel harvesters ship their eels alive to, to Asia for Chinese farmers to use as seed material for their vast eel farming industry. They add 10 times worth of value, turning our raw goods into a final product. We want to make as much as possible of that finished product right here in North America the eel farming industry we envision would create hundreds of jobs. We, ban we began investigating this effort in 2004, around the time the Fish and Wildlife Service began, two, began the first of its two ESA assessments. Since 2014, we have invested one and a half million dollars in supporting work, a series of internally run experiments at Dalhousie University in Halifax. These efforts established the safety and effectiveness of a medicated fish feed which dramatically increases the speed and size of growth in aquaculture. Our internal work enabled the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to open up a file for an investigative new animal drug earlier this year. Our pharmaceutical grade medicated feed is presently being manufactured. After next year's glass hill harvest, we expect to commence our pivotal studies. Experiments at independent certified labs necessary to obtain drug approval from both the U.S. and Canada governments. We hope to be farming eels with our approved product on a pilot scale in 2019 and to open up one or more commercial eel facilities in 2020 or 2021. Our commercial plans are naturally focused in those areas where glass eel fishing already takes place. But we are prepared to make our proprietary eel feed and farming methods available beyond Canada and Maine. We've identified eel science and aquaculture colleagues at universities in several ASMFC states or who are enthusiastic to be part of the effort. It appears likely this board is about to embark on Addendum 5 in the near future. Addendum 4 includes an aquaculture provision allowing states to grant 200 pounds of glass eel quota for use in a domestic facility. Addendum 5 will give the board a chance to take another look at this provision. My colleagues and I hope that the board will consider a mechanism for states to join together, pool obligations, and share resources in connection with the aquaculture quota. At some point, every state will likely cast a vote on aquaculture issues. We hope each state will study its opportunities as well. Nova Eel welcomes suggestions, ideas, and proposals from all stakeholders and will advance some of its own. 
At a minimum, we hope the Commission will allow the State of Maine a reasonable degree of flexibility to pursue its goals in the, er in the area of eel quotas for both commercial fisheries and aquaculture. The Maine DMR has worked hard to earn this deference. We look forward to working with the PDT, TC, and Eel Board on this important matter. On the, matter of ye of, on the question of yellow eel quotas, the Fish and Wildlife Service has twice told us that the eel population may be at the low end of its historic range, but is not endangered. It has been stable and present over most of its historical range for more than a full generation since the collapse of Great Lake stocks was first observed. Our adult eel harvest is locked down at the low end of its long-term range. We question the landing numbers, but we don't disagree that the stock is low. ASMFC's next stock assessment seems likely to find that the species remains depleted. Industry looks forward to reviewing the stock assessment and will share with the technical committee, peer reviewers, and eel board any relevant information that may be overlooked during the assessment process. We are particularly concerned that the glacial recruitment indices are not being accorded proper weight. Again, I commend the ASMFC for reaching its 76th anniversary. Thank you, commissioners, for your attention, and staffs and committees for all your hard work. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, I think you'll be available if anybody has questions for you later. Uh, next up, we have Sarah Rademacher of American Unagi to discuss eel culture in Maine. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sarah Rademacher, and I've been growing eels up in Maine for the past three years. I started a company called American Unagi um, that's been focused on taking Maine harvested glass eels and growing them out for the domestic seafood industry. I'm here today just to introduce myself, let you know about the work that I've been doing, and also our intention to request an aquaculture quota for 2019. I, um, my background is in aquaculture. I've been in the industry for over 15 years, and that's included education, facility management, and industry development, both internationally and domestically. And I came back to Maine to start an aquaculture business. And when I saw what was happening with the glass eels being shipped abroad and then importing questionable product back in, I really saw an opportunity to produce a better product for the U.S., but also provide value and jobs um, in the state of Maine. So 2014, I dug in I, um, and wanted to validate this idea. So I started with a couple of tanks in my basement. And then the following year, built a pilot facility at the Darling Marine Center, and in 2016, put the first deals into the U.S. market. We've gotten really great feedback, and we've had a lot of support from the Maine community, and also groups like Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center, Maine Technology Institute, USDA, Maine Sea Grant, that have all helped um, the progress of this company. I've also had the opportunity to um, get a talented group together of, of advisors from both the fisheries, seafood, and aquaculture industry to help this business progress. Um, I'm <clears throat> really excited about it, and the last three years have been super successful. So we're looking to get out of the pilot facility and into a commercial facility. And part of that success of launching that facility is going to be having a secure source of glass eels. Um, we've been, from the very beginning, having a very open dialogue with the Department of Marine Resources, and recently we've been discussing this opportunity to do the aquaculture allocation for 2019. So I just wanted to share with you some of the work that we're doing, um, that we're really excited about this opportunity and have really worked hard the last couple of years to show that this can be a valid business and a valid industry for the U.S. So I look forward to working with all of you in the future, and thanks for your time. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next up, we have Jeff Pierce of the Maine Elvers Association. Good afternoon, Chairman Glack, distinguished members of the American Eel Board. My name is Jeff Pierce. I'm here on behalf of the Maine Elver Fishermen's Association, and thank you for allowing me public comment. In, August 2nd, uh, in the August 2nd meeting, I submitted a letter for public comment about the good work the State of Maine, Department of Marine Resource, and the Maine Elver Fishermen have done to stop poaching, such as implementing swipe card systems, and many other positive things that have dra dramatically improved this fishery. I will not repeat them at this time. 
2012 Maine glass eel catch was 18,000 plus pounds. 2013 Maine glass eel catch was 20,000 plus pounds. 2014 Maine was put on an allocation quota of 11,749 pounds, about a 46 percent cut from the 2013. 2015 Maine was cut again uh, to 9,688 pounds for a three-year period of allocated quota. The three-year period is up, and we would hope that this board would return Maine's quota to the 2014 level of 11,749 pounds for the 2018 season. We, the Maine Alpha Fishermen, appreciate your considerations on increasing this year's quota. There's also a question of a new addendum on this agenda. We look forward to participating in this product process and hope that aquaculture is part of this co uh, conversation, perhaps as part of a conservation credit. We look forward to exploring these options. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, that concludes our public comments. We will now move on to item four, which is the 2017 American Eel Stock Assessment Update. And Jeff Brust uh, will be presenting the assessment update. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good afternoon to members of the board. Uh, yes, for those who don't know me, I'm Jeff Brust with New Jersey Marine Fisheries and chair of the American Eel Stock Assessment Subcommittee. Um, before we get into the 2017 update, I just thought I'd set the stage with a quick reminder of what we did in, uh, for the benchmark in 2012. Uh, the methods were we, we uh, did a thorough review of the biological data. We looked at uh, a lot of different indices at local, regional, and coast-wide levels. Um, so there was a lot of uh, index-based assessment working going on at this point. Uh, we did, and then we looked at um, trend analyses, so a range of different methods, uh, Mann-Kendall methods and AREMAs and things like that. We did try a data-poor assessment method, the depletion-based stock reduction analysis. Um, what we found with, uh, through the peer review was that there were significant declines in many of the surveys over the time period that we were looking at, some of them extending back to the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, the peer review panel did not endorse the findings of the DBSRA, and so because of that, we did not have any specific, any official um, biological reference points. Uh, so no overfishing or overfished determinations could be made based on just the trend analyses. Um, and because of that, um, because of the declines, but without having any official biological reference points, the, uh, the committee and the peer review panel recommended that the stock status be found as depleted. Uh, so we started the update in 2016. We looked at the data again. We, look, uh, we did a thorough review of new research uh, and literature since the benchmark. Um, because it was an update report, we did not rewrite the entire document. We, we uh, relied heavily on references to the original benchmark assessment. Um, the introductory sections were updated with the new literature where we found them. We updated the indices uh, and the data through 2016 where they were available. The methods we used for the update were very consistent um, with what we did for the benchmark. There were a few tweaks that were necessary, and I'll, I'll try to highlight those as we go through the, the rest of the report. Um, because the DBSRA was not approved by the peer review panel, we did not uh, attempt to update that. It, it wasn't approved, so there was no need to, to update it again. So the, the report was made available in the meeting materials. Um, the agenda item is up there, so presentation of the assessment update by me, and then I guess possible management action by the board. Um, before we get into the actual meat of the assessment update, I wanted to thank the uh, Stock Assessment Subcommittee and the TC, and in particular ASMFC staff for the support they, they provided in, in developing the document. So just a reminder, um, the, we broke the coast up into uh, multiple management or multiple regions. They're not management regions, just regions um, for data analysis, and those are shown up there on the slide. Um, a reminder also that the stock unit is all American eel population occurring in the territorial seas and inland waters along the Atlantic coast from Maine to Florida. We know the stock extends north into Canada and south into Mexico and, and South America as well, um, but the stock that ASMFC has purview over is the Maine through Florida coastline. 
As I said, landings data were updated through 2016. Uh, for commercial data, we tried to corroborate all the different sources of data, so state landings, federal landings, and everything through ACCSP, make sure everything was co consistent and coherent. Um, a couple of biases that, we, uh, that were in the that were addressed in the benchmark that we uh, are carrying forward. Obviously, uh, ASMFC in most states do not have jurisdiction in freshwater, so any harvest uh, that occurs up there is not included. We, tried, we looked for indices that occurred in freshwater, and I guess, I think we have a couple, um, but very few states had any landings information from freshwater jurisdictions. Uh, and also uh, reported in the benchmark was concerns about the commercial reporting uh, this was addressed through Addendum 4, so I'm happy to report that we had better data reporting for the update than we did for the benchmark. Here's a slide of commercial landings um, through 2016. I do want to point out that for the, I think it was the 2009 stock assessment, we used only three regions, North Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic, and South Atlantic. Um, and so that's what this slide shows. There's no easy way to split the landings to the regions that we have now um, because they are watershed based and no one collects data from watersheds. We collect it from the state. So these are not quite consistent with the, uh, the, man uh, the assessment regions that I showed on the previous slide, but it gives you an idea of where the landings are coming from. And you can see, um, Looking back uh, into, the, we had a peak in landings in the 70s and early 80s, and it declined from there. Uh, but for about the last two decades, it's been relatively stable, right around a million pounds. Here's the same slide, or a similar slide with landings in the dark line, um, as well as the uh, commercial eel value in the dashed line there. And that uh, strong uptick in the recent years is most likely an influence of the glass eel fishery the price in the glass eel fishery. We also um, collected, uh, or we, we utilized the recreational catch and harvest information. Um, due to the change from MRFs to MRIP in 2004, we did use the calibration. Um, you can see that most of the information, or most of the eels that are caught are discarded alive. This is, again, we don't think this is excellent data, again, because eels extend up into freshwater and the MRIP survey does not extend into uh, freshwater areas, so we think there's probably a significant amount of catch that is not being reported through the MRIP. Um, but either way, the, the recreational landings are very low relative to the uh, commercial landings. We're, we're looking at a couple hundred thousand eels as opposed to a couple million pounds, or a million pounds. Um, so moving into the indices, we had 20 state mandated young of year uh, glass eel indices, as well as two that were not mandated by uh, ASMFC. Um, the slide up here has a couple of different color codes. Uh, the yellow, uh, the, I don't know how well you can see those from the back. Hopefully you can at least see the regions listed here on the left. Um, suffice it to say that there were the, the two in yellow are the non-state mandated um, Young of Year, uh, yellow, uh, excuse me, glass eel surveys. Uh, the two, or the three in green are new from the, uh, we, we did not use these in the benchmark, we added these during the update. And the three in red um, were updated as late as we could take them, but that none of them went through 2016. Some of them were uh, discontinued, some of them they changed the sampling location, and so we, we took it as, as late as we could um, with the data that we were given. So those are the 22 glass eel surveys. Um, and just to walk through them very quickly, uh, I'll show each region's glass eel indices. Um, so here's the Gulf of Maine. There were three there. And I guess one thing to keep an eye on when we're going through these, uh, notice that um, in any given region and also across the coast, there is no consistent trend in um, the, the, the pattern uh, or you know the, the index of abundance. So, here in the Gulf of Maine, here's one going up, here's one that's pretty flat, and here's one that's going down. Um, so there's, you'll see across the coast and even within a region, there's not always a lot of consistency, and they are highly variable. So here's the Gulf of Maine. Southern New England, we had four. I'll go through these relatively quick. I'll leave them up long enough for each state to see their index, and then I'll move on. 
New York, we, uh, excuse me, yeah, the, the Hudson River, we only had one glass eel index. It's from the Hudson River Estuary Monitoring. This is one of our longer time series. It is not mandated. It's not one of the ASMFC glass eel surveys. Um, the Delaware Bay and Mid-Atlantic Coast, we had four. We have three of them that are uh, ASMFC mandated, and the one in the lower right is a Rutgers ichthyoplankton survey that is not a required ASMFC survey. Chesapeake Bay, there were six. And South Atlantic, we had four. Uh, and I know this is a little bit hard to see. We did a correlation analysis. Um, the idea, uh, the, the hope is that we will get a lot of indices that are showing the same trend. Um, and so uh, I've highlighted the ones in red where they are showing a statistic statistically significant uh, similarity in their trend. Um, they're all positive correlations, which means they're all showing the same trend. If there was a negative correlation, they'd be going in opposite directions. It does not mean that the index itself is going up. It just means that these indices are showing the same pattern. Um, so for the update, we had 20 significant correlations. All of them were positive. For the benchmark, we had 10 that were positive and three that were negative. Uh, and if you're following along in the document, because I understand, I, I recognize this is hard to see, this is table eight from page 97 of the PDF report. And you'll see that in the Northeast, at least, we have pretty good consistency. There's a lot of the indices are showing similar patterns, at, at least in the Northeast. Moving on to yellow eel indices, um, there were 15 of these. We uh, standardized these using GLM where possible, possible uh, to try and take out influences of non-abundance based uh, changes in abundance or you know changes in the index between years so trying to account for temperature um, and timing of the survey and things like that the three or four highlighted up here again these are ones that we were not able to update through 2016 um, either because this again the, the the survey location changed or we didn't receive the data or the um, the index was, uh, the survey was just discontinued. Um, for the Gulf of Maine, we had no yellow eel indices. For southern New England, we had two. For the Hudson River, there were three. And again, you can notice uh, they vary widely between years and also within and across different regions. There's not always a consistent pattern. Delaware Bay and Mid-Atlantic, there were four. Chesapeake Bay, we also had four. And for South Atlantic, there were two. Again, we did correlations to see, hopefully show that they, were, that they had similar patterns. Um, this is table 10 on page 100 of the PDF document, if you want to get a closer look at it. Um, Again, in the Northeast, we see a lot of similar trends. So the ones in red are statistically significant in terms of their similarity. Um, and for the, yellow, uh, for the yellow eel indices, there's actually um, more similarity with the southern indices as well, which is a good thing. Um, so for this, we had 23 significant correlations, all of them positive. Again, a positive correlation does not mean the index is going up. It just means that they're showing a similar pattern. So those were the individual glass eel and yellow eel indices. And then what we wanted to do is try and combine them regionally and also combine them across the entire coast. So for the coastwide indices, we did a, uh, for the young of year surveys, we did a long-term uh, index, which extended back to the 1980s, and also a short-term index that was only since uh, 2000, I believe. And then for the yellow eel indices, we were able to do three different indices, one for 20 years, one for 30 years and one for 40 years. And the longer the time series is, the fewer surveys that were included in that combined index because we, we only have so many indices going back 40 years. Um, we also did regional indices for glass eels and yellow eels. And then in a minute, I'll get into the different trend analyses that we did on these to see if these, in, these combined indices were providing any information. So the coastwide young of year indices, the coastwide glass eel indices, the top left is the short term index, and the bottom right is the long term index. And so the short term goes back to 2000, and the long term index goes back to 1988. Um, 
These are the indices that are included in the 20, 30, and 40 year combined yellow eel indices. And I'm sorry, I don't have the actual table listed up here, but it's going to be table 11 or 12, I believe. And you can see, um, so one change from the benchmark is for the benchmark, we used a PSE and G survey that went back to the 1970s. But when we looked at it in a little bit more detail for the update, we realized that they had changed gears a couple of times and that the, the, the gear was only consistent back to 1998. So it no longer met the 30 or 40 year requirement. Uh, so we were only able to use it for the 20 year index. And so here are the, the three coast-wide indices for yellow eel. And the top left is the 40 plus year. Uh, and the top right is 30 years and the bottom is 20 years. The regional young of year indices. Um, I don't know if you can see these in the back. The top left is the Gulf of Maine going down on the left side. So Gulf of Maine, Southern New England, Hudson River, and then the right column is Delaware Bay, Chesapeake Bay, and South Atlantic. And then, oh, so, all right, so correlations for these regional uh, glass eel surveys is shown up here. Pretty good correlation among those in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. And then here are the regional yellow eel indices. Again, um, on the left column is Gulf of Maine and Southern New England where we had no yellow eel indices. Uh, and then the Hudson River in the right column is Delaware Bay, Chesapeake Bay, and the South Atlantic. Bless you. And correlations among the yellow eels, uh, there were actually no significant correlations, which is unfortunate. Um, and you can sort of see that looking here. There's, there's a lot of variability here. Oh, sorry, did you catch up? <laughs> sorry. Um, and then, so one thing that we wanted to look at is hopefully the glass eel index is going to correlate with the yellow eel index a couple of years later as those eels grow older. We should be able to hopefully see the same signal on the yellow eel and the glass eels from a few previous years. So we tried correlation analyses um, by lagging the yellow eel and the glass eel indices a couple of different, uh, a different number of years. Uh, and I forgot to highlight this one, but the Hudson River actually worked pretty well. Uh, not a lot of significant correlations among the other uh, regions between their glass eel and yellow eel indices. So those were the, 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 the individual indices that we looked at and then we just talked about the combined indices, regional and coastwide. The next step was to do trend analyses on these, uh, some actual statistical tests on these to see if there's any information in the trends that they're showing us. The four things that we looked at was a power analysis, which is, uh, it tells us the, the, the strength of the index. What's the probability of being able to observe a trend of plus or minus 50% over a 10 year period if it actually occurs? If there's so much variability, you're not even going to be able to see a trend. Um, so this tests how, how uh, powerful the, 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 um, the index is in being able to show us a, a trend if it actually exists. Uh, the Mann-Kendall test just identifies whether there's a significant increase or decrease over time. A Manley analysis does something similar, it, and it's comparing among the different uh, analyses to see if they're all showing similar patterns. And then the ARIMA is a smoothing process. Um, it's, it's another way of developing an index, but it, it also gives us the opportunity to compare to a, a reference point. It's not a biological reference point. Um, we use the 25th percentile of the uh, observed data points and I'll step through each one of these individually. So for the power analysis, um, this is table 18 on page 106 of the PDF document if you're following along. Um, this shows that our surveys, our indices, range in their ability to show us an actual trend if it actually occurred. Some of them have a very strong power, like this Connecticut DEP electrofishing that says that there's a 100% chance of us seeing a trend if the trend actually existed. Um, and then there are some uh, that have a very low probability, such as the, the uh, Delaware Bay uh, Young a Year Survey in Turville Creek, which gives us only a 6% chance of seeing a trend if it actually exists. And these are based on the amount of um, the CV, the, the amount of variability, uh, interannual variability seen in the index. Um, 
So if you have a lot of variability between years, it's not going to be able to show you a trend. It's going to, be, it's going to look like noise. The ones with small CVs are going to be the ones that give us a lot of power and the ability to see a trend if it occurs. For the man Kendall, this is just, again, just showing if there is a significant increase or decrease over time. Um, and we, the, the last two columns on the right there, the, the second to last column is the trend that, or the result that we saw from the benchmark in 2012. And the, the far right is the trend that we saw for the update in 2016. You can see most of them, both for the update and for the benchmark, show no significant trend over time. Um, you can see, though, in the Gulf, of, there are a couple uh, that are showing a significant decrease over time, uh, one in the Gulf of Maine, one in southern New England, and one in Delaware Bay. And then, next page. Uh, yeah, so this table continues. Chesapeake Bay, there are none for either the benchmark or the update that show a significant decrease. And in the South Atlantic, there's actually three that are showing a significant decrease that were not showing a decrease. Um, during the benchmark. So, oh, I'm sorry, so those were just for the glass eels, and so now moving into the yellow eel indices, uh, these are, um, these show a bit more variability or more significant results, um, but again, very similar to what we saw for the benchmark in 2012. So here are the northern three regions for the yellow eel indices, the southern two regions for the yellow eel indices. And so hopefully it's evident, but an up arrow shows that it's a significant increase uh, in trend, and a down arrow is a significant decline in abundance over time in the index. And here are the regional, um, young of year and yellow on the same table. Again, very similar to what we saw for the benchmark. And here's just a, a, a quick synopsis of what we saw for the Mann-Kendall analysis. The, the results are not 100 percent com comparable between the benchmark and the update because, like I said, we added or subtracted a couple of different indices. But overall, um, the update is showing six negative declines or significant negative um, trends in the young of year data that were not observed in the benchmark. Um, for the yellow eels, a couple more negative or excuse me, a couple fewer negative, but also a couple fewer positive increases, uh, and regional, it's about the same. The Manley results, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, just suffice it to say that the, this uh, analysis showed that there is a consensus for decline in both life stages, so there were enough indices that were showing a significant decline um, for both glass eels and yellow eels that the, the result was significant. Um, but we had the same result for the benchmark, so it's not any worse news than we saw during the benchmark. For the ARIMA, uh, again, this is a smoothing um, analysis. You can see the dots on these uh, plots are the observed index, and the solid line through them is the ARIMA estimated model. Um, and then you'll also see the dashed line on each of the plots is the 25th percentile um, so it's the lowest 25th percentile of the observed values. And what we're looking at here is the probability of the index, the, the ARIMA index, being below that 25th percentile. Um, we only did this for surveys that had 20 years or more. So if it, if it was only, you know, 19 or fewer years, I, uh, we did not include it in the ARIMA just because uh, the models fit better with longer time series. And so you can see that there are a couple here that, that are below the, the 25th percentile, but many of them are not. Um, so I'm sorry, this first plot, we did not have any for um, Gulf of Maine or southern New England that met the 20-year requirement. So the first plot was the Hudson River. Here is the Delaware Bay and Mid-Atlantic. And you can see that this arima is very dependent on the first year of the uh, of the first value in the time series. So the, the top right and the bottom left, you see they fit that first year almost perfectly and then a straight line through the rest of it. Um, so it's, it's not always as useful as we want it to be. And then for the Chesapeake Bay and the South Atlantic. And a summary slide for the ARIMA results. Um, 
the, the, the column on the far right shows the probability of being below the 25th percentile value uh, in the terminal year of the index. And w just for comparison, we looked at the probability of being below that 25th percentile in 2012, uh, just for comparison to the benchmark. Uh, and what you'll see is that most of them did not change that much. So we had one um, that went up pretty significantly. So the uh, New England Elosine Beach survey went from 34% of being below the benchmark in 20, 2012 up to 72%. So that shows that we've declined over time. Uh, but there's one also that, uh, that went up pretty significantly. Um, I'm looking for it here. And I don't see it. I'm, I, I'm I won't waste our time looking for it, though. But the overall, most of, the, most of the surveys did not change the probability of being below that benchmark uh, since, the, since the benchmark assessment over time. Um, so yeah, real quick, the benchmark had two surveys where, the where we had a higher than 50% probability of being below that 25th percentile benchmark. For the update, we had three surveys. Most of the others, or all of the others, were above um, that 25th percentile. Uh, and what this suggests is that um, the, the indices are relatively stable, have been relatively stable since the benchmark was done in 2012. Uh, the changes that we did see were small, and some of them went up, some of them went down. There was no consistent directionality, directionality in the change. So just a real quick recap, what have we seen so far? We looked at individual young of year and yellow eel indices. They're highly variable. There's no consistent patterns. Uh, same with coastwide and regional yellow eel and glass eel indices, highly variable and no consistent patterns. We did multiple different trend analyses. Uh, we did the power analysis, uh, which shows that many of the indices we're looking at have low power and maybe not a lot of ability to show us a trend if it actually occurs. The man Kendall showed many, uh, several with significant declines over time. These were mostly the ones with longer time series that go back to the 1970s and 1980s uh, when we saw that spike in uh, harvest. The Manley analysis said that there is consensus among the indices for a decline over time. This was similar to the benchmark. And the ARIMA shows us that most are not likely below the 25th percentile value of the index uh, for the years that we have data for. Again, we don't have any biological reference points because uh, the, the DBSRA was not approved and we can't develop those without a, 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 a life history model. So we don't have any official stock status determination for the update. The trend analyses did show significant, significant declines in several of the indices over the time period, but they do appear to have been relatively stable over the last decade or so. Um, the benchmark concluded that the prevalence of the significant downward trends in multiple surveys was cause for concern. Um, the trend analysis results in the update are consistent with the 2012 results, and so the, the assessment committee and the technical committee uh, have determined that the stock of American eel remains depleted. Uh, and that's it. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Jeff, for, to you and to the Stock Assessment Subcommittee for another excellent job of an, analyzing a lot of data. I know there have got to be a lot of questions here, so can I see some hands of those who have questions for Jeff? And uh, I see Rob. And Rob, why don't you go ahead and start, and I'll just write down the names of everybody else. I saw Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jeff. And I have three short questions. Um, Jeff, when you showed the young of year indices, and I realized the correlations are really not significance testing um, and have no cause and effect, but you were pointing out the ones that were positive, but did the committee do anything as far as ranking beyond the positive? So for example, there was some that were 0.5, a few that were 0.2, I mean, it is a correlation, uh, so I was just wondering if that occurred. No, we didn't go, in, we didn't go beyond the correlation analysis, um, and we need to be careful um, s because it's, the, the value itself is not as meaningful because um, we have different lengths of time series, and so it's not just the, the, the p-value, but it, it, well, it incorporates the, the, the number of years uh, that are available as well. So. Ranking them just based on the p-value was, um, or based, excuse me, based on the, the correlation value is not necessarily meaningful. Follow up, Rob. Follow up with a different question. So 
I don't see a lot of catch per unit effort information, and it would be for the yellow eel um, for the fisheries, and it would be great to see that to get some indication of availability or abundance depending on, you know, which of those it might be showing. Um, is it just that there's not a lot of information uh, among the states to have that information, or is it something that has been talked about but not completed? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I remember talking about it during the benchmark. You're right, though. There are not a lot of states with it. Um, trying to remember, did we? I don't think it was included in the benchmark even, so that's why it wasn't included here. I'm looking at Kristen. Hopefully, she can remember as well. So. The benchmark did have commercial CPUE for the yellow eels. It was not part of the update because it was not used in any of the analysis. But uh, it's definitely something we talked about that if we went back to a benchmark to try to more thoroughly get that data from the states. Uh, is this a follow-up, Rob, or is this a different question? Different question. Uh, well, okay, last one. All right, and it'll be my last one. Um, the DBSRA, so from what I read, it will be the next benchmark, but there seems to be some promise that that's the way to get these biological reference points so that we're not sort of in a situation where trying to determine what depleted means every time we get an update, how depleted and everything else. And I know that uh, you personally worked with the DBSRA probably seven or eight years ago, not on EEL, so I think you're probably the person to answer that question. Yeah, so we, we did use it for EEL, and it, it is one of these promising um, models to, to provide reference points where we don't have a lot of, well, when we don't have reliable age data. <clears throat> we still need to be careful using it for EEL, though. Um, the, the, the issue is, again, we don't have much, if any, information, both harvest and index information from fresh water. And so one of the concerns that was raised is that when we used it in the past, we were only modeling the marine portion of the population. Um, in addition, we need to be careful because the, the model assumes that carrying capacity uh, has been constant over time. And with the, you know, the, the advent of you know, migratory barriers and things like that, there are things happening with the population. Well, there, it's suggested that there are things happening with the population, either mortality or carrying capacity or productivity, whatever, um, that need to also be uh, hopefully accounted for somehow if we do a model like that. So yes, it does have some promise, but it's not going to be, uh, I, I don't want to give anyone the impression that it's going to be uh, you know, the silver bullet. Thanks, Jeff. Next question is Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Jeff. That was a great presentation, and I know this was a challenging one, so thank you. Um, I have one question that maybe has two parts, and the first, the first part of it is that there's a lot of discussion in the document about stability in the indices, and it seems as though the places where you're picking up trends that either continued or have appeared since the benchmark are on the edges of the range. They're in the north and they're in the south, and the stability appears to be in the middle. So I, I'm left wondering a little bit about what we do with that information, if anything, because, and here comes part two, as a lot of us, I think, around this table are really struggling to understand what is the right thing to do with eels. Um, there's been discussions about where the cap is set and the triggers. I wonder, in the assessment, when we're using trend analysis, if those results that say not significant are actually masking some more positive news, because I guess I don't understand if those trend analyses can account for variability. So, for example, in an index where you have in recent years, it may not be consistently trending up, but you do see more frequency of higher abundance indices. And I, so that's, sort of, that's my question is, are all of these ticks down this table that say non-significant, some of those that say non-significant, actually to me, I look at them and I say, well, 
that's great because there's been five episodes of, of higher than average recruitment in the last five years compared to a flat line in the five years before that. So my concern is how we are interpreting the results. Um, I'm certainly not questioning the results of the assessment, but I do wouldn't mind hearing some commentary from you on, on how, uh, what you think about that trend analysis and the inherent variability in the system. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so you are correct that the, the trend analyses are not providing, um, they're all lacking in terms of the amount of information that the, the trend analysis itself can give us, which is why we tried multiple different versions. Um, all I can say, though, is, is that we used the ones that we thought were going to give us the information. Uh, we have had con conversations about, you know, the utility of each one. And, you know, yeah, questions just like yourself. Is, it looks like we've had five high years in a row followed by one low year. And is it that one low year that's influencing the, the, the determination or, you know, the result of that analysis? Um, none of them are perfect, which is, what, again, that's why we did multiple different trend analyses, hoping that collectively they would provide us the information we need. Um, I, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer or not. Does that answer your question, Lynn? I think it did, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I guess the, the challenge really is, um, you know, going forward with this, figuring out a way to make sure that we're adequately characterizing um, the trajectory of, of the populations. And I know there's no real answer for that right now. So, yeah, satisfied. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, next we have Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jeff, um, wouldn't you expect uh, constraining harvest like we have for the period of time that we have, that that would show um, more positive effect? And if the question is yes, then <clears throat> are we possibly looking at a situation that's similar to many of our other species that are not responding uh, to limiting fishing mortality, and it's obviously other factors. And then should we not then be looking at a different outcome um, and not trying to chase the replenishing the stock to the level that it used to be. So a, a couple of different ways to take that question. Um, first, recognizing that the board has uh, restricted harvest and all that. And yes, if harvest is restricted enough, then you would see, you would expect to see increases in population if the population was able to do so. First point, though, is that we as I've said a couple of times, we don't know what's happening in fresh water, and we really don't know how productive this stock really can be, um, which is why we're stuck doing trend, or partly because of and partly the reason for us doing trend analyses. Um, so one way you could, one way to respond to that is, yes, you've restricted harvest, but perhaps it hasn't been restricted enough. And I'm not saying yes or no, it has or it has not. Because the second answer to that is, we already discussed the impediments to migration and, and things like that, which might themselves be affecting the productivity of the stock. Um, and so to your point, perhaps we should not be expecting increases. Perhaps it's just fine where it is right now. Um, so on the one hand, Perhaps it's, it's, you know, other factors. And on the other hand, perhaps we just don't have the information we need to have made the, the cuts required for the stock to come back. It's stable now. That's a good thing. Uh, it's no longer declining. Uh, so the, the, the restrictions have at least moved us in the right direction. But I think it's hard for anyone to say if we know enough, 
if that harvest is the one that will cause a stock increase. Follow up, Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, then uh, how long would you uh, be comfortable if the stock continued as it is now? So if we don't change mortality and the stock does not respond, how many years do we look at this this way before we say this is not working and we have to do something different? Can I plead the fifth on that? Um, you I don't may. know if I want to give a personal opinion at this point. Um, it's been a, a decade or so that it's been flat. Um, these, these critters can live 20, 25, 30 years. So um, it could be that the, 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 the cuts we've made, um, those, the first cohorts after those cuts are just now reaching maturity. Um, I don't know. And again, we don't have great age data for the, the, the out-migrating adults, but we know that males are, I think it's like six or seven, and it depends where you are along the coast as well. It, it's different in the north and the south, but you know, males it's five, six, seven, and females it could be 20 before they're even migrating out. So it, it could be a while. Um, Kirby. So, Rich, just a, another thing to in follow up to uh, Jeff's comments, you know, about a lot of uncertainty, you know, I'm going to go through this a little bit with the allocation working group summary later, but effectively, you know, we know that landings have, accre have increased coastwide relative to the last stock assessment. So, you know, in, in looking at, say, baselines, if we incorporate that information, it's actually been a higher removal than what we had previously. What that means? For the population, we don't know, um, and so we, you know, we're in a hard press spot to try to provide any kind of speculation on on that. But that's just something to, to keep in mind. If I could just interject before we go to our next questioner, um, Jeff, when you showed the commercial landings, just want to make everybody aware that most of the landings are coming from estuarine waters. The lifespan of eels in the estuary where the yellow eel fishery is prosecuted is typically from three to six years is where we see them emigrating. So just that graph you showed with the stable landings, that's probably four or five generations of eels that have outmigrated and produced more. So that's just something to keep in mind, that that upper lifespan is from freshwater. But where this fishery is prosecuted, that is not how long they stay in the estuary. Uh, with that, next question is from Lance Stewart. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the point I'd like to make is that I think it'd be, it's extremely difficult for us to look at young of the year indices and think they're real. The amount of glass eel variation between all these tributaries is so dramatic and changes from year to year that it's hard for us as scientists to capture a number that would relate even to the eschewing yellow eel stage. And I think that comparison is just hard to ever make. Most important thing is, of course, the silver eel. And we have very little data that's being collected on the silver eel abundance or most concerning the mortalities that we could have some effect on changing. Downstream migration, turbines, all that mortality that occurs from man-erected structures uh, could extremely affect glass uh, silver eel production, which completes the cycle. So I'd like to see that some of the states adapt a silver eel census to go along with, with the young of the year yellow eel, which I don't think is a connect at all. It's how much is pretty being produced in silver eel output. Um, that's the main thing. I think we're focusing on the wrong relationship and trying to make the statistics work and looking at controlling a local fishery that really doesn't, I think, uh, generate the numbers of the stock that we're, we're looking at increasing. Yeah, just real quick, thank you. That's a great comment, and I believe it is included in our research recommendations. There have been a couple of states that have uh, gone beyond just the glass eel surveys and started a yellow eel survey, um, and it's the, the, the research recommendation was to do like full life history surveys. So glass eel, yellow eel, silver eel. I don't know if any state have actually 
started a silver, silver eel survey, um, but it's at least a research recommendation. Now is the time. All the silver eels are migrating out to the Sargasso right within the next 30 days. <laughs> okay, um, I had Adam on the list next, but I don't see him here. Okay, so next is Pat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jeff, that was a great presentation. I, um, I think that the take-home message for me in hearing it both with the subcommittee and now is we do have some stability, but I was going to kind of go in the direction that, that Lance just went. There's the, such a high variability of catch year to year um, within the, especially the, with the young of the year. Um, there's two elder fishermen here in the audience that could tell you that from where they fish, there's wide ranges of um, uh, product elvers within those river systems from one year to the next and um, why they have to move so much in order to, uh, to reach their quota. How, how do we take that into account? I mean, just adding a life cycle. I mean, we're started our life cycle study within the state of Maine as a requirement of the FMP. Do we need to do more of this? Do we need to, you know, do the TC and plan development teams, are they taking into account temperature issues, flow issues? Um, I, you know, the, the, some, sometimes in, during the spring, we could actually miss that run depending on uh, staffing issues associated with it. How are we addressing those type of things? So when we develop the indices, we do, uh, we're doing general linearized models. So yes, we're trying to take into account those non-abundance based uh, factors that might be influencing how many eel come across or, you know, that we see in the survey each year. So temperature and flow and things like that. Um, I think if we go to, I think it's the first extra slide. Um, what, what I did is, you, we, for the yellow eels, or excuse me, the glass eels in particular, um, we did um, the, the, the long-term and the short-term combined glass eel indices, and I put them on the same plot here, and they're made up of totally different surveys. So the, the, the long-term is just two surveys, one in, um, excuse me, there's three surveys, one in Beaufort, one in um, outside Atlantic City, and one in the Hudson, and then the short-term is all of the state surveys. Um, and they're showing a very similar pattern, except for one or two years, they're 2008, 2009, maybe 2010. But you see from three, or from completely different sets of surveys, we're showing a very similar pattern. So in any one given system, it looks like there's a lot of variability. Um, but certainly now, the longer the time series we get, they're actually showing some consistency on a coastwide or regional level. So it, 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 you're right though, it, it's always been a concern with the technical committee about the interannual variability in the glass seal surveys, but I was actually pleasantly surprised when I put these on the same plot, and they're showing some level of consistency among the two different, you know, combined indices at a coast-wide level. So it, it, that doesn't get rid of the, the concern, and I think every year the technical committee talks about the variability in the glass seal surveys, and should we drop some, should we add more, what do we do with these? Um, but at least the, the longer the data set becomes, um, they're starting to see, I'm, we're starting to see patterns, so. Thanks, next question is to uh, Robert Boyles. No. Oh, you're resting your hand, okay. Then do we have, uh, Lynn, did you have another question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a quick follow-up into Richie's point um, and a follow-up to my original comment, and I think Jeff, um, had just said that, you know, the news is that we seem to have gotten ourselves into a place of stability. Um, and and I think when you look at the regional differences and one of the issues that we have in Chesapeake Bay, when you look at that index and it's, it's figure 58 in the stock assessment, the Chesapeake Bay yellow eel index is, you know, it's increasing. So the availability of these things for whatever reason you know, in the middle of the range seems to be doing something different than it is um, on those edges. And so that, that sort of reaches a little bit to Richie's point on what are, you know, what are our management actions? You know, what levers are we pulling to control, to control this thing? You're right, Lynn. I'm, look, I'm looking at the, the plot right now. Um, it's figure, or it's slide number 33, if you want to pull it up. Um, 
It, it is increasing. I do have a note here that I unfortunately never followed up on. Is for some reason that index stops in 2010 uh, in this slide. So, um, I, and I, I don't recall why, but that doesn't mean it's not still increasing. I just don't know what's happening after that in, that increase. It's because one of the surveys that that index is based on wasn't updated for the update. So if you recall for one of the yellow eel regional man kendalls that it was positive in the benchmark and still positive for that survey, it's because that survey was actually not updated. So it's the old data set that went into that index. And that's why that's an abbreviated time series. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, I just had a question myself, and it kind of follows up on what Lynn was saying. Given that 90 percent of the eel harvest, yellow eel harvest, is coming from the Chesapeake and the Delaware drainages, and those areas showed so little trend, um, did the subcommittee uh, think about that, why a panmictic species like this would only be showing declines in areas where it's not exploited? Uh, I don't recall getting into discussions like that, but um, it's certainly worth looking into. So, And then just one uh, other thing that I'm just a little confused about in there was the uh, why the power to detect negative trends was so much was better than it was to detect positive trends. And does that play out in which trends you found, the, the surveys you found significantly decreasing? Would a survey having a similar increasing trend not have been found to be significant because of those differences? Uh, to be frank, uh, someone told me why that it was e it's easier to, de to detect a negative trend than a positive trend, but I don't recall what the answer was. John Suica did the analysis, and, and he can explain it. Um, but the, the differences were very small and between the, the power to detect a positive versus a negative trend, and I don't think it would have influenced um, the, the results at all. So. Okay, thanks. Just curious. Any further questions? Um, Lance. Yeah, just, just a concern about the young of the year index, whether it's real or not. And if the states are doing it, what type of consistency between states in the type of sampling gear they're using, the length of time they're using to generate that young of the year quantity? is extremely important. It's, it's very vari variable. If you've ever fished glass eels, they pulse. It's a night fishery. Whether you use fike nets or dip nets could be entirely different on what you get as a quantity. Um, I was just wondering if there's some coordinating aspect other than this board <laughs> of using a gear that are comparable state to state or you know any particular stream to stream. What you pick as an indicator stream is extremely important, you know, and I guess if we had more glacial fishermen, they'd be able to guide us, but uh, given the lack of that, uh, we have to take that into our own um, management methods within the states. So type of gear, stream selected, to have any confidence whatsoever in young of the year values. You're right, and so the, again, the TC has talked about all these different issues. Uh, right now, the way the plan is written is it's up to the—I believe it's up to the state to determine the location and the gear type. Um, and you know, the, each state probably went with what was easiest for them. Um, you know, because we're all under financial and, and staffing difficulties. So. I would expect we all went with the, the lowest common denominator uh, right now. So right now it is not um, dictated location or, or gear type. So, um, and I guess if we went that route and everyone had to use the same gear and, and all that, we'd lose the time series that we have now. We'd have to start over. Um, so recognizing it is a concern, but um, also there, there are cons to, to taking it to the next step as well. That's right, Jeff. When this survey, when the plan was first passed, um, because this is the first time a plan mandated a, a fishery independent survey like this, there was a lot of concern about having it as easy for the states to do as possible and to use whatever was being used there. Thanks. Uh, do we have any further questions for Jeff? Seeing none, thank you again very much for that great presentation. And. Uh, You'll see the second part of this agenda item is to consider management response to the stock assessment update. 
I thought we'd hold that off till the uh, item six where we're going to be discussing uh, broader management uh, responses to American Eel. So with that, uh, let's move it on to consider the 2018 glass eel quota for Maine. If you will recall from addendum four, Maine's glass eel quota was set for three years, which uh, expired in 2017. And then there's the option in the addendum to uh, re, uh, renew Maine's quota for 2018 at the same level as the addendum four level. And uh, but to do that, the board has to vote to, do th to make that motion to do so. And <clears throat> if we can uh, take care of that, then we can get on to discussing in the next item management responses that would take care of uh, some of these issues. So. Oh, well, that's even better. Kirby's got a presentation on this. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll go through this pretty quickly. John highlighted some of the, the main points I was going to go over. So there's the addendum four provisions. Uh, there's the prior allocation working group recommendations that I think are important to keep in mind. There's the current allocation working group recommendations that was formed at the last board meeting and the next steps, and I'll take any questions. So Maine's glass seal quota was established through addendum four. Um, currently that's at 9,688 pounds. It's based on the 2014 landings level. That was a recommendation that came from the last allocation working group. The quota was specified for three years, so 2015, 16, 17, and the quota would be as stipulated in the addendum to be reevaluated after the three years, but prior to the 2018 fishing season. So the 2014 allocation working group laid out four main reasons for why that allocation should be set where it was. The first was uncertainty and the added conservation benefits with a lower quota. The second was the social economic impacts that would potentially play out for local communities that are fishing on uh, this resource. The third was expected increased levels of poaching and enforcement problems by lowering the quota further. And the fourth, and I'm going to just make sure this is noted or caveated at least, uh, there is an expected inability for Maine to complete an important life cycle uh, study. As you all know, part of Addendum 4 lays out that uh, Maine is to do that. They have been carrying that out. Um, they have 2016 data that I believe they're getting ready to, to uh, share with the technical committee soon, so that's just something to, to note um, there. Now, uh, when the allocation working group met, we reviewed the glass seal harvest over the last 11 years, and I've got up on the screen now what those landings were. Uh, these landings were validated with the state as part of the stock assessment process, uh, in part thanks to the work of ACCSP uh, staff. So as you can see, there's uh, generally good tracking with what the addendum four numbers were versus what uh, the numbers were uh, validated through 2017. 2016 and 2017 are still preliminary, so please keep that in mind when looking at these. But you can generally tell that in 2016 and 17, landings tracked very well with the quota. They're approximately 94% for those two years of Maine's quota. 2015 is an outlier year. When the allocation working group that was formed at, la at the last board meeting met in September via conference call, uh, there was one recommendation by one of the working group members to increase Maine's glacial quota back to the 2014 quota level of 11,479 pounds. But overall, the group recommended that Maine's glacial quota should be maintained for 2018 at the current level that's been in place the last three years of 9,688 pounds. So with that, uh, for the board's consideration is specifying Maine's glacial quota for 2018. Again, as John alluded to, uh, maintaining the same quota level is allowed under the provisions of addendum four. Um, an increase in the quota level would require a new addendum. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Kirby? on Maine's 2018 quota. Mark. Kirby, um, I don't know the details of the previous addendum, but is there a default value to which it would uh, fall if, if the board doesn't do anything? Or what happens? 
So um, I would just point out we kind of have a similar discussion about this with uh, Menhaden uh, before, which is right now without a specified quota, there isn't a quota. Uh, so therefore, harvest could continue, but under no restrictions effectively. Any further questions about Emerson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kirby, thank you for your presentation, but I'm, I'm not clear as to what the, the reasoning is behind the, uh, the working group's recommendation that the quota be maintained at the same level and not increased. Thank you, Emerson. So there are a number of allocation working group members around the table, and they may be able to speak better to why they felt that it should be maintained for the 2018 season. And again, this is just the recommendation for 2018 only. Um, the second part of my presentation uh, that's under the next agenda item will we'll lay out the other uh, points that were raised by the working group. And I just reiterate, Emerson, it's in the addendum. The addendum gives the board the ability to uh, extend Maine's qu addendum for a quota for one additional year, which would be 2018. That's why the working group recommended that. Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I was going to reiterate that as well as I think once Kirby gives his presentation that if the board should choose to move forward with an addendum, I think it will be revealed that the working group's recommendation was that Maine's glacial quota would then be reconsidered through the course of another addendum. Yeah, yes, Emerson. Thank you. Follow-up. So then my understanding is that in terms of process, um, the main reason was keeping it at the same level so that we didn't have to initiate another addendum at this point in time unless we decide to do so under the next agenda item. Is that right? Well, that obviously it takes a while to pass an addendum, so there probably wouldn't be an addendum in place for 2018, which would mean Maine would have no quota during 2018. So the thinking was if we initiate an addendum now, Maine will fish under this quota during 2018, the addendum four quota, and then there will be an addendum five for 2019. Thanks. Uh, any further questions? Uh, Cherie? I don't have any questions. I'd like to make a motion. Uh, let me just uh, let Tony get in on this. I just want to, uh, it's the charter that allows us to extend the provision of this addendum. You can extend a provision of an addendum for six months, and then you can extend it again for another six months while working on um, a revision to the document. Because the addendum actually for the glacial harvest expires at the end of this year. We said we would revisit it in 2018. Um, so it would be using that charter provision. So it would just be for six months that you would extend it. And then if we need to, um, we It was extend written right it. into the addendum, wasn't it, Tony? I mean, it uh, says it right in the addendum that it could be extended for an additional year. For I, I don't see it in the document, John. Um, in any event, it's, it can be done, right? Okay. Uh, Sheree, you want to go ahead and make a motion? Yes. I'd like to make a motion um, that Maine's glass eel quota shall be maintained at the 2018, for 2018 at the status quo level of 9,688 pounds. And um, leave it at that for now. Okay. Do we have a second? Pat Keller. Uh, okay. Um, Tony has just informed us that we need a two-thirds vote for this. And so uh, before we get to that, though, are there any comments, questions about this? Okay. It'll be a roll call. Okay. Um, Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify the comments that you made, that if this does not pass, it, it doesn't mean that Maine does not uh, have any quota. It means they have unlimited quota. Uh, I'll throw that back to Tony. 
It's a good question, Richie, and we debated that for a while in Menhaden. It's, it's, it's unclear. The plan is silent. So there's two, two perspectives that came out in the Menhaden conversation, which were there's unlimited quota or there's zero quota. And, you know, the plan doesn't, doesn't help us clarify that. So it's unclear what happens if there's no, you know, if, if a motion similar to this or some other action isn't taken to set a quota for Maine. Any, uh, any further discussion of this item? Okay. Are there any objections to this, this motion? See none, do we still? Seeing there are no objections, therefore it obviously passes by a two-thirds majority, so the motion is passed. Yeah, Bob? Now that, now that the vote has been taken, just a technicality. Since we, the board, the charter only gives boards the authority to extend for six months. Six months from now, we're going to have to revisit this just to, you know, essentially re-vote on it or, or, you know, verify at the board level that they want to, you know, uh, extend it through the end of the calendar year. So it's just a, it's a technicality, but I, you know, I think the board's intent is clear. We'll just have to go through that technicality. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Sheree. I'd just like to get some clarification. Um, are we looking at a year from now, if we go six months in six month increments, or do we need to have this start January 1st? I think based on the conversation, it's clear the board wants to, you know, it's for 2018. So the, the quota that's in place right now continues through the end of this calendar year. And the, you know, 2018 quota starts on January 1, 2018. So I think, I think the record's pretty clear. That's the intent of the board is to start this at the beginning of 2018, carry it halfway through 18, revisit this as a technicality, and then complete 2018. Okay, that, uh, that should conclude that agenda item. Now we're on to the American Eel Allocation Working Group Report and Recommendations. And is there a report on that? And Kirby has a report on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think that hopefully my presentation will outline kind of the overall goals that the working group was trying to get at and might alleviate any concerns that were raised on the timetable for the motion that was just passed. So. Uh, there was an allocation working group that was formed, as I said, uh, coming out of the last uh, board meeting. I'm going to go through a little bit of background. Uh, the issue items and recommendations as we've now dispensed with Maine's 2018 Glass Hill quota. Uh, there's just two parts to it that I was going to walk through uh, fairly quickly and then take any questions. So first is background. We have addendum four uh, that was passed in 2014 that laid out uh, yellow eel quota management and allocation and the glass eel management for Maine. In the summer of 2016, we had a proposal from New York to change the state-by-state -state quotas. That was shelved until after the stock assessment update. In the summer of 2017, we provided the board with an update on 2016 preliminary landings, uh, preliminary yellow eel landings, excuse me, uh, effectively 1A of one of the management triggers we have in Addendum 4. And based on that information, uh, if it held up through finalized landings for 2016, we would have uh, triggered the first part of one of our management triggers. In September of this year, we had this uh, allocation working group uh, meet. Uh, just a typo I have up here. It says REC. It's actually uh, allocation working group. I deal with a lot of other REC working groups, so sorry about that. Uh, but they met by conference call twice and developed some recommendations. So addendums for provisions for yellow eel, we have a coastwide cap of 907,671 pounds. It's based on an average landings from 1998 to 2010. There's also a filtering approach that I can try to provide a little bit more clarity on if there's any further questions. But basically, under this coastwide cap, there's no state-by-state -state quotas currently, but if the coastwide cap is exceeded, either by one of the two management triggers, we go to that. The first one is if the coastwide cap is exceeded by more than 10 percent of an, in any given year, so 998,438 pounds. The second trigger would be if the coastwide cap was exceeded for two consecutive years, so either by a pound or 50 pounds or 1,000 pounds. Uh, Two years of consecutively exceeding the coastwide cap per the addendum four provisions means automatic triggering of state-by-state -state quotas. 
The new coastwide quota would be 907,669 pounds. Under that approach, uh, if a state had uh, a quota overage the following year, there would be pound for pound paybacks. Uh, there would be quota transfers that are allowed between states to cover those overages, but um, just to be clear that if, if there were no transfers granted, then that state would be uh, liable for dealing with that pound for pound payback. So it's also important to keep in mind that since addendum one to this FMP, there's been an effort to try to improve the accounting, the monitoring of landings uh, across the coast. Uh, addendum four had implementation plans to further get at better accounting of the commercial eel landings. States needed to demonstrate that they would both be able to monitor landings um, in a situation where we move to state by state quotas if needed, um, as well as have metrics in place to close uh, their fishery. Many states still are on a monthly reporting basis, and it's a little confusing because in some instances states may have daily reports, but those aren't collated until the month level, and so we aren't effectively really treating that as daily or weekly reporting. And many states' rulemaking process would create challenges if an automatic triggering of uh, two years exceeding the coastwide cap or one year exceeding it by 10% caused an automatic tripping of the, of the uh, management trigger in implementing state-by-state -state quotas. So with the help of ACCSP staff, I just want to call them out for, for all their hard work on going through a process with the states as part of the stock assessment to get as much uh, of an updated uh, set of information across the coast. Uh, the stock assessment list, the, the information is preliminary. That's an important distinction. Today, um, I'm offering up what we call validated yellow eel landings. They are not final yellow eel landings. Validated means that ACCSP staff has worked with the states to go back and, and verify that these landings are in fact true, looking at compliance report information. Um, ACCSP will finalize data later this fall. So that's just an important distinction. I have up on the screen now landings for most of the states and the coastwide total. There are three states that are either at zero or confidential level of landings, and so I, I don't have those listed here. Uh, some other important caveats when it comes to looking at uh, the landings information that has been validated. Uh, it's from the states during the period of mid-August through early October 2017. Um, it includes validated landings from all of the state partners with the exception of Connecticut, whose landings were not included uh, as being uh, updated and validated due to not responding to uh, the request for validation. Potomac River Fisheries Commission data is not validated by gear type, and the data is provided using state landings from Maryland and Virginia that have validated their state landings, but in turn, those landings that are attributed to PRFC uh, obviously take place either in Maryland or Virginia because you can't land in Potomac River Fisheries Commission. New York also provided updated information for 2015 and 2016. They added any non-dealer fisher landings to their dealer landings. And since the dealer reports don't always list the correct gear type, they uh, distribute the total dealer landings amongst the gears reported by fishers that are sold to a dealer. So the allocation working group discuss the concerns around automatically triggering the state-by-state -state quotas given the timetable of when landings are actually finalized in a given year. Um, as you are aware, for 2016, as I said, we would not know for sure that final landings indicate that um, the, those, the coastwide cap uh, either exceeded by 10% uh, or two, consecutively, two consecutive years um, until later in the fall. And so, uh, trying to implement something like that mid-season presented a lot of uh, concerns. So the two con uh, recommendations that the allocation working group make are to move to implement state-by-state -state quotas beginning January 1st, 2019, if the management triggers have been exceeded based on final 2017 landings information. That should be, av be available excuse me, in the fall of next year. The second is to initiate a new addendum to consider alternative allocations, management triggers, and coastwide caps to the current management program for both the yellow eel and glass eel fisheries. 
Um, additionally, there's the commercial yellow eel state by state quotas. The allocation working group noted that based on the stock assessment information that was provided to them at that point preliminarily uh, in September, there was interest in considering different baselines for basing allocation on, on for landings from the years of 1998 to 2016, and the interest largely stems from regulatory changes that have been put in place since 2014. It's important to note that the prior technical committee recommendation when asked as part of addendum four what the coastwide cap should be set at recommended a 12% reduction from the baseline period. That was ultimately not implemented. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to share with this group was regarded validated landings for 2016. If, say, we were under a situation where state-by-state -state quotas were implemented, comparing the state's quota to their validated 2016 landings, there's a number of states that would uh, potentially be over in the future if landings were consistent between now and, say, next year. If the same harvest level was seen in 2017 as we're seeing in 2016. So that would apply to Maine, Connecticut, New York, Maryland, PRFC, Virginia, um, and then obviously coastwide, there's a, a, a slight overage. So that's just something to keep in mind. This is a hypothetical. I want that to be clear. We are not obviously under state-by-state -state, uh, quotas at this point. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions for Kirby about the working group's recommendations? Bob Ballou. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Kirby. Uh, regarding the first recommendation, I, I get the point of uh, extending uh, out to t January 2019 the implementation of state by state if it, that trigger were hit. Does the addendum allow for that? Um, currently, it does not. This is another part of the Commission's process where per the uh, charter requirements, I believe, and I'll look to Bob and Tony to give some more clarity on it, but that we can extend through emergency action the ability to respond to management uh, effectively delayed based on that. Now, keep in mind that there's two parts. There's the first recommendation regarding if the uh, coastwide cap was triggered. The second is to initiate a new addendum. So keep in mind that if a new addendum were to be initiated and say approved in spring 2018, that would then possibly change what the coastwide cap is, what the allocations are, and the response. So that's something to keep in mind that this is another kind of stopgap or emergency rule type of approach. Yeah, Tony. Uh, I don't think we would use emergency. Emergency action has a series of def definitive um, things that go along with it to justify the emergency action, um, and I'm not sure we would meet that criteria here. Um, the, I mean, the coastwide cap is set in addendum four for yellow eel, and it doesn't have an expiration date like the um, glass eel quota does. Um, but the, you know, the board obviously can work on an addendum to make a change to, to that cap um, and the provisions of that cap. Um, and the working group obviously did talk about these ability to um, implement if the cap is exceeded two years in a row, when they could actually do that because we don't have final data until the end of the year, so it wouldn't come into play until later on. And if the board does do an addendum this year, I would assume it would be finalized before the end of the year, which then would replace the addendum four provisions um, and hopefully work out the problems. Any other questions for Kirby? Kirby, would you just, once again, did you mention where the cap was set? Was it the 2010 landings level? Um, I'd have to double check on the exact number. I believe there was a filtering process that was applied because it's not simply just the average number of years of um, 1998 to 2010. That was the base years and then those were kind of augmented based on some more recent years data and then a filtering approach as I said. Yeah, Jim. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Kirby, can you put up that last slide, the, the hypothetical overages? If, uh... So if we got into transfers to cover this thing, there's obviously not a f enough transfers to cover all the overages. So. Um, we, we would get into an issue of uh, who can get to North Carolina faster. 
Uh, <laughs> so has there been any thought to how we would uh, deal with that whole issue? If I could take that. Um, thanks, Jim. Yeah, I mean, one of the questions that the working group was wrestling with was these problems we know exist in the state-by-state -state allocations that went back and uh, the difficulties of implementing all this. And, of course, the first problem being we won't even know for sure whether we have to do it until later next year. And so that's why as long as we have to go to an addendum process anyhow to address the glass seal situation in Maine, uh, the working group thought it would be a good idea for the board to consider going, uh, including in the addendum, the yellow wheel provisions also. Just look at everything in the yellow wheel. As we saw in the presentation, our landings obviously went above the cap in 2016, but overall they've been steady for over 20 years. I mean, fluctuating in a pretty narrow range. For most other fisheries, that would be seen as a pretty good thing. But I'm inserting my opinion here, and I don't mean to do that. Uh, so anyhow, um, I guess at this point, do we have, oh, Lynn, do you have a question or? Uh, I was prepared to make a motion, Mr. Chairman, and if I get a second, I would speak to That'd it. Great. Uh, please proceed. Thank you. I move to initiate an addendum to consider alternative allocations, management triggers, and the coastwide cap relative to both the yellow and glacial commercial fisheries starting in the 2019 fishing season. We have a second, Marty Gary. Lynn, would you like to uh, speak to the motion? Yes, thank you. Just briefly, I, I really wanted to just um, speak a little bit, and obviously I come from a state with a fairly large dog um, on the field. Uh, you know, Addendum 4 uh, was in a way very well done because by implementing this cap, uh, it bought us some time but also provided the impetus to control annual mortality to constrain the harvest a bit on eels. And I think that was effective. And it is clear when you re go back through Addendum 4 that the there was a lot of discussion about what would happen when we go to a state or jurisdiction specific allocation that it's problematic because of the variations in the market and in the environmental conditions. And so here we are staring down the barrel of a trigger um, which maybe in retrospect wasn't as well thought out because now we're in a situation where if we go over by just one eel, um, we're going to find ourselves in this situation where we have uh, jurisdictional quotas. Um, that can be very hard to um, create a lot of legislative and administrative burden to, um, to monitor. So I would hope that with this addendum we can really start to address some of these issues that maybe Addendum 4 didn't quite get to. And I would also say that because allocation is what allocation is. All of us are looking at what's going to happen um, when that trigger is fired, but I think I would encourage us collectively as we travel down this road to think really hard about what the specific allocation problem is that we're trying to fix and target the fix rather than just open up, um, you know, open up for another um, spicy discussion about, uh, actually the discussion can be spicy, but the point is that we just uh, really try to focus on fixing uh, where the issues are. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Do we have further discussion of the motion? Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to ask if the alternative allocations includes exploring a different baseline. When 2010 was chosen, it was on the basis of that was the last data year um, from the benchmark. We've now had an update, so is it possible that the alternative allocations also include um, exploring a different baseline? I think that was the intent of the working group, Rob, to put all options on the table. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, in that case, 
we can put this uh, motion to a vote. Yes, Is this, there any are there any objections to this motion, first of all? Oh, well, seeing no objections, um, the motion, therefore, will pass unopposed. Okay, so that settles that. We'll be going to a new addendum. Uh, and that ends that item of the agenda and brings us to other business. Yes, okay. A uh, couple of quick items. Uh, we have been in contact with uh, a representative, the, uh, the Minister of Canada's Division of Fisheries, Department of Fisheries and Ocean, uh, uh, Minister LeBlanc, and uh, there's a possibility the minister will be coming to the winter board meeting in February to address the board and uh, discuss invigorating the MOU between, uh, I think it was between Canada and Atlantic States, uh, Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and, and NOAA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, that is a, uh, should be an interesting possibility for the uh, winter meeting. Um, and other than that, the only other new business we had is once again, uh, if you can look at, included in the supplemental materials, is a uh, uh, little summary uh, by staff of the activity level needed for uh, American Eel. Right now it's at low, since I guess the assessment was just completed, but now that you're doing an addendum, are you going to adjust this, Kirby? Yeah, just that, that's another point that, you know, as we had this morning with Shad and River Herring, our di diadromous doubleheader for today, um, to keep in mind that when, when making changes or tasking the TC or initiating new management documents that it adjusts what we say the activity level is for some of these groups, so. Richie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm thinking over this motion, um, I mean, this really is starting from scratch. The, the way I read it, and the last time we started from scratch, it took a lot of work of a working group to come to something that uh, the board would agree to. So I'm wondering whether that makes sense to start with a working group on this right out of the gate. That's a great suggestion, Richie. Michelle? Yeah, and I, I think you know, that's really what Lynn was alluding to, Richie, is to really focus on what the heart of the issue is. I mean, I think, you know, clearly fisheries wax and wane. And so under this, I mean, the intent of the coastwide cap was, you know, to constrain harvest. And certainly, you know, in some areas the fishery has grown and other fishery in, in other areas it's, it's waned a bit, I think, you know, a lot of that, at least in North Carolina's instance, has to do more with market than um, availability of the resource. And so it's really how do we address kind of the, the waxing and waning needs of the fishery and perhaps try to avoid having to implement state-by-state -state quotas in the first place. So I think that's really kind of what Lynn was getting at as we move down this road. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Russ? You know, just following up to what Richie said about the working group, I'm sure as hell glad I'm retiring and I don't have to be on that working group. Thanks. We can pull you back in, Russ. Maybe we'll get Des on there for you, too. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, you know, one quick follow-up. I, I think that it is true when we went through the allocation process the last time that the the board really wound up doing the best that they could possibly do to mitigate um, damage equitably to the different jurisdictions. And, that, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I think it's important for us to focus on the problem. And like Michelle said, you know, how do we get at this fluctuating variability? And I would also hope what I didn't say is, I would like to think that there's a way to responsibly manage eels without state-by-state -state quotas. Um, so that's just something for everybody to um, ponder if they can think of a way to do that. Uh, let somebody know. Thanks, Lynn. And with that, is there any further business? Oh, Bob? Yeah, just, just a thought. You know, the 
When we're looking at the overages or the hypothetical overages from, from 2016, some of the individual state overages percentage-wise were pretty large. But when you look at the whole coast, I think the, the coast-wide overage was barely 2 percent. So, you know, that, uh, you know, there wasn't this, you know, flagrant, you know, exceeding the coast-wide quota. We, 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 overall, the, the fishery was constrained to the quota, more or less. And, you know, I, I think that's something to be proud of. So, you know, potentially triggering a, a very expensive state-by-state -state quota system and a state-by-state -state monitoring system and everything that comes along with it for less than or about 2 percent of a quota is, you know, that's a lot of effort for, for very, you know, the value of the eels that we went over is much less than the expense of the, the monitoring system we would have. So, you know, trying to figure out some way to work within the coastwide quota, I think, is we're not that far off right now. We just need to shuffle the deck a little bit, maybe. I hear that, Bob. Lauren? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, perhaps this is out of order, but I did see Mitch's hand up. Uh, would it be possible to hear what he has to say regarding public comment? Uh, sure. Come on up, Mitch. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make a quick point and didn't ask one quick question. Uh, everyone should remember that in 2014, when we struggled with the working group, struggled with these very issues, we also had uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service's second uh, endangered status, endangered species assessment uh, being done. And uh, obviously the fact that that has been completed now and completed with a pretty definitive statement should uh, provide some cl further clarity as we go forward. My question was, uh, you heard two people during the public comment mention that uh, the aquaculture provision in Addendum 4, as currently written, um, you know, is, is implicating future decisions made by people in the uh, industry. I'm aware that the Technical Committee has, in fact, struggled with criticisms or concerns about the uh, aquaculture addendum, the aquaculture quota that exists now. I know that uh, a party from another state has been before the Technical Committee several times addressing concerns. I just was hoping or could we clarify or could we assume that consider alternative allocations is language broad enough to uh, contemplate the fact that that would be a subject of discussion during the plan development. Thank you. Well, Mitch, we're going to be considering the, the glass seal quota and all the glass seal items also in the addendum, so I'm sure that will be part of it. Um, one other issue that Kirby had, has looked into and can speak to now is trying to get better uh, data on the exports of eels, and he has some information about CITES. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife sitting at the table might be able to speak to this better than, than I, but Kristen and I were approached about uh, the recent stock assessment update as part of the CITES process um, that took place last year. There was a request to better evaluate the trade of anguilla species worldwide, and so U.S. Fish and Wildlife, I believe, is going to be trying to work with whoever the appointed contractor is of CITES to compile a report of landings and in turn export imports of, land, of uh, eels of, you know, leaving the U.S. and going to other markets. Uh, so that is something that is going to start to rev up, my understanding is, in the early part of next year. Um, but that was the extent of the information we were given um, on our call, and there may be an opportunity for uh, those representatives from the Fish and Wildlife Service to come and, and maybe give some more clarity on how that report is going to be generated and what the potential implications of it are regarding the CITES process. Sherry, do you have any information on that? I don't have any information other than what um, Kirby presented. I think that was accurate, and we would be happy to have uh, Fish and Wildlife St Service staff come and, and update the board. Thank you. Great. Um, is there any other business to come before this board? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you. Um, the, the next meeting is ACCSP. We can start that in about 15 minutes. But for those commissioners that aren't part of ACCSP, 
The dinner is at the Nauticus um, at 6.30 tonight. It's, you go out the hotel, you make a left, and you go and you walk right into it in about two blocks. So um, there's no transportation. Just walk down there. It's only a couple blocks away at 6.30, right, John? Yeah, he's talking. But I think it is 6.30. It's not the Nauticus. Oh, the Half Moon Center near the Nauticus.